Today's lecture is our continuing, it's the second in a series of four that deal with world religion. Uh, today it is Christianity. Who has been to church ever? Some of you have never been to church. You've been to church? How many people um, were raised at some point Catholic? and Protestant, and other. What was the other? Methodist? Okay, um, Quaker? The, if you want to get a sense of the variety of approaches and experience in Islam, Think about the variety and approaches of experience uh, that we see just in this room in Christianity. It is a remarkably diverse universe of uh, religious belief uh, with a wide spectrum of intensity. And um, the, what we're going to talk about in terms of the Christianity in the context of global history or perhaps we should say world history, especially as we move backwards in time, it's less and less global, more and more local. Um, what we see, what we're going to be looking at, are the specific ways that Christianity played a significant role in big events, in big movements. Uh, and again, uh, it gives us one more opportunity in a series of opportunities to look at one of our favorite things in this course, which is what is the relationship between the form of the architecture, the spaces that are created by the arrangement of those forms, and the relationships between how does the, those formal spatial arrangements relate uh, to the institutional arrangements of a society. So over and over again, we see this remarkable uh, synchronization between the formal spatial order of the architecture. Uh-oh, things go badly when that turns off. It's not supposed to happen. Um, the formal spatial arrangements of architecture in relationship to institutional arrangements, especially in terms of power. And uh, earlier in the course, we were very much uh, interested in uh, how trade uh, operates in this context. Uh, as, uh, as we move towards the present, trade takes on an ever-increasing role in terms of the big power formations that we see around the world. We also look at not just trade, but the nation state and what the nation state uh, as an institution or as a series of distinct institutions, but within a global ordered system of nation states, what, uh, what does that, uh, how does that manifest and what role do the formal spatial arrangements have in relationship to those institutions? Uh, as we move back in time, we really have to uh, alter our mindset and our approaches. And that thing that in our lives and in our lifetimes and in our society might manifest as this augmentation of life, this spice of life, this uh, the matters of the soul and the spirit, that these things that are kind of separate from the core of our existence, as we move back in history, that separation gets less and less. And who we are as uh, religious subjects and actors within the context of a religious system increasingly becomes who we are uh, in every way. And so uh, that's one of the shifts that we need to go through as we move back into this subject matter. We also, once again, need to uh, adopt the empathic voice and the empathic mindset what was it like to be a Christian at this point in history? Okay. Let's see what happens. Our first stop is Hagia Sophia. Uh, 
which is Greek for the Holy Wisdom, the Church of the Holy Wisdom. And this is one of the most remarkable constructions in history. We, uh, it's in what we now know as Istanbul, what was then known as Constantinople. We're going to stop in just quickly in the Suleimanye Mosque because we've been here before. This is a familiar site for us. And just next door, and it's very similar in form, we see this Christian church uh, built by Justinian, started in the year 537. Justinian was the emperor in Constantinople, a city named after Constantine, the first Roman emperor to first uh, permit Christianity to be practiced out in the open. It was banned for 300 years. And then Justinian said, let's tolerate it. And then he made it the official religion of the Roman Empire. And uh, he also established an eastern branch of the Roman Empire way across the Mediterranean Ocean. Uh, if you're not clear on where it is yet, let's watch again when we move from this site to the next one. We'll see the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, but he established the Eastern Roman Empire. And in the meantime, the Roman Empire in Rome was, uh, went into decline and was overrun by the Ostrogoths and uh, fell. And leaving the only vestige of the Roman Empire here in the East in Constantinople. Justinian becomes emperor uh, in the 6th century and immediately takes on, uh, with great confidence, the task of reconquering the Mediterranean Empire. And so he leads his armies across the Mediterranean Sea. He recaptures the Italian peninsula, recaptures Rome. He establishes a new capital for the Western Roman Empire, in, not in Rome this time, but in the city of Ravenna. Uh, and he, then he builds this church in Constantinople, uh, the only preceding dome-like structure is the Pantheon that we will study in great depth uh, in coming weeks. But this dome is very different from the dome of the Pantheon. It still mystifies us where this came from. It was such a leap. Uh, and it, a thousand years later, we saw with Sinan, uh, the great architect of Istanbul, uh, struggling his entire career to uh, outperform this dome. And he doesn't do it in the Suleimani Mosque. He falls short by several feet, both in terms of diameter and height. But he eventually does it, it under the next emperor, uh, not Suleiman the, the Magnificent, but Selim. Uh, he finally builds the Selimenye Mosque in Edirne, and that one, finally, a thousand years later, uh, surpasses the stone. Um, now, that said, uh, this dome was radical enough that it actually collapsed and had to be rebuilt. And uh, it still has trouble to the present. Um, it's a, compared with the Pantheon, it is remarkably thin and lightweight. And in the second version, uh, after it fell... Um, a few decades after it was first built, they increased the sense of lightness by adding this row of windows around the base of the dome. And so we're going to look at some of the structural characteristics uh, of this dome. Uh, but first, uh, we're going to look at some of the precedents, that is, if the uh, slide order allows us to. But this uh, gives us a sense of those punctured openings at the base of the dome right where you would expect the forces uh, to produce the greatest structural challenges, um, Justinian has his builders uh, puncture it uh, around the bottom. And the structural role is played by these short ribs. They're kind of like buttresses. And a thousand years later in the Suleimani Mosque, they are actually flying buttresses that come up and connect to the dome. Uh, and it's remarkable uh, to see the similarity between this Christian church in the Greek uh, Orthodox tradition of the Eastern Roman Empire, of 
Byzantium. And these words cluster together, and I'm trying to be consistent. I say things like Eastern, Greek, Orthodox, Byzantine, or a Byzantium. I try to cluster those words together because they go together. And they are in opposition to the Roman Latin. So they're speaking Latin in the West, in Rome, and they're speaking Greek in the East. And you'll recall uh, when we were in Moscow that the great source of Christianity for Russia was the Eastern Church. And it was based on reports by the ambassadors from Vladimir, who was shopping around for a world religion, you'll recall. Because world religion, religion has the, uh, plays a very important role in unifying a society and mobilizing a society for doing larger collective things. If you want to do something big, conquer a neighbor, uh, achieve great, great constructions, uh, it helps to have a way to mobilize uh, a large population. These religions offered it. Vladimir wanted some of that. And based on the reports of his ambassadors coming from Constantinople, they reported that Hagia Sophia was so magnificent, they weren't really sure if they were still on earth or whether they had been transported to heaven. And this is a theme that we're going to see throughout uh, the examples here. So the, the remarkable heights, could someone do me a favor and um, dim that source of light? We finally got the projector adjusted and um, don't want to get it washed out. So it looks like the slide order was altered, um, but we're going to be fine, I suspect. So here's this dome over Hagia Sophia. Uh, it later, uh, you will recall, the, the fall of Constantinople to Mehmed II, uh, the Ottoman, uh, and it's transformed into a mosque with the addition of the four minarets. And we'll look at some of the other alterations that occurred. But we're going to uh, apparently go into some of the slides that indicate some of the continuing structural challenges. Look at that deformation of the uh, pendentive. Now you remember, remember those words squinch and pendentive? A squinch is more of a spherical or partial sphere element that performs the same task uh, that the pendentive is performing. Um, basically, we're back to that challenge of when you have a domed structure that sits on an, a rectangular orthogonal base, you have the problem of fitting the, the round peg into a square hole. How do you fit a round peg into a square hole? Squinches, in the case of many of the mosques that we saw with the mucarnus hanging stalactite uh, details. Here we see a pendentive. A pendentive is a smoother transition that um, comes up from the corners in a, a surface, a, cur a double curvature surface. And here's another view of it. Um, it's actually high resolution, so we could actually explore it a little bit. But um, we're just going to say, here's the main dome, an expression of the ribs, uh, the grand arches, that the main dome sits on top of these grand arches at four points. The pendentives make the transition from the columns uh, and the arches up to the spherical dome. And then on on two sides, you have arches that are filled with what's called a tympanum. And a tympanum is like a timpani, which is a drum. And uh, it's just a stretched uh, surface, a plain surface that's stretched in the archway. We'll see it more closely. And then on the ends, uh, we have half, half domes. And this is uh, the tricky structural configuration of Hagia Sophia. This is uh, one of the dozens of engineering studies that have been performed showing the deformations. Uh, it's quite fascinating to see how dramatically the forms of this uh, structure have actually been deformed. And so here's a linear shot where we see it go from the underside of the dome through the half dome, uh, again with the perforated windows around the base, and then the apse which is the uh, indicator of the end bay of the church, and then down. 
Um, because it was a mosque, they have left, and now it's a museum, they have left some of the Islamic uh, emblems that are were performing the role of covering up the figurative uh, icons. So uh, it's an interesting story in terms of the transition from, yes, icons are okay, and then under the uh, Greek uh, Orthodox Byzantium Christian leadership said, icons are not okay. And so the Christians have their own taboo on iconoclasm, uh, on icons. Uh, so they have their own iconoclasm. Uh, then it, later it becomes okay, and the faces and figures are uncovered again. And then under Islam, they're covered back up. And then when um, uh, Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, uh, who we got to know when we looked at Ankara, when he leads uh, the country, the modern nation state of Turkey, to independence, um, he uh, secularizes everything, including Hagia Sophia, where it becomes a museum. And he starts the process of uncovering some of the Christian uh, icons so that museum goers can see a fuller representation of the life of the church. Um, the panorama. And now the structure. Let's see these forces, the thrust forces that we'll be continuously referring to that we've seen before. When you have an arch uh, and, it's, and it's a heavy arch, the downward force, uh, the gravitational pull on that arch causes uh, lateral forces to thrust outward. Those are called thrust forces. Uh, in a spherical dome, you have the same thing, only now it's concentric. It goes in every direction. The great challenge is even though it's a thin dome, it still weighs an awful lot uh, because of its size. There are huge thrust forces that need to be managed at every linkage, every step of the way, moving down the structure and distributed around the perimeter. And you see these massive piers that are uh, providing the greatest counter force to those thrust forces from the dome. So there are two different distinct strategies of how to bring those forces down. This is one that uh, we think was considered and rejected in favor of this one, although the dome ended up being a much uh, flatter, shallower dome. Rem if you will recall the challenge of Brunelleschi's dome uh, in Florence Cathedral, that the higher pointier the dome, the lower the thrust forces were. Uh, and the more controlled, the closer it is to the natural uh, catenary curve uh, that uh, Robert Hooke, the author of Hooke's Law, for those of you who've taken physics, uh, identified as the ideal curvature for a purely uh, compressive structure, which this is. No tension forces, uh, no f uh, counteracting forces in tension in this building. In Florence Cathedral, you remember there was a chain uh, of wood and stone with iron linkages, and that chain was a tension structure that controlled those forces by uh, having them pull on each other through the action of the tension ring. Here, there is no tension ring. It's not like the Aztecs uh, and the Incas, where everything was all about tensile structures. Um, this is all compression all the time. And so the piers are massive. And... Uh, you should read in this plan that this is the actual effective distance of the pier. You'll know from your moment of inertia calculations that uh, the height of this element is, in the calculation of the force of resistance, is raised to the third power, whereas the width is uh, just a direct multiplier. And so the deeper you make it, the greater the structural advantage. And that informs uh, a lot of what we're going to be seeing today. And so as we move up and plan, we see um, a lighter, lighter and lighter structure, and then into the dome, and you see the perforation of the dome, the upper dome, and then the lower domes shown here. And this is kind of a summation uh, in a complex uh, cutaway axonometric view. Uh, you see the dome itself resting on these grand arches, uh, that then come down to these piers. Here the piers are cut away, but you can see them in outline more on that side. And that's what brings the forces down side to side. On the ends, you have an elongated shape 
uh, because of the half domes. And this whole strategy of Hagia Sophia is to, on the interior, you hide all that structural acrobatics. So the first thing it does is goes through extraordinary measures to handle the structural forces, and then on the interior, it smooths it over. No expression of the structural acrobatics on the inside, leaving more space for the icons uh, of the church. And the structural elements themselves are dematerialized with this rich, ornate motifs. And you see the emblem of Justinian encoded in the capitals, the column capitals. They also produce this effect through using uh, polychromy, the multicolored stripe uh, of uh, marble uh, quarried uh, in the region. So here's just a plan that shows all the different locations of the important uh, icons and the symbolism. And so the church, uh, unlike the mosque, it doesn't denotate uh, through direct verbal writing, uh, unlike the MIT facade uh, that says Newton on it, unlike uh, the Islamic architecture that has script that quotes the Quran and other scriptures. But this one, uh, in Christian tradition, we often have these narrative uh, imagery that tells a story. So it becomes uh, a vehicle of mass media, and we'll be seeing that uh, throughout. So here we see um, Justinian bowing before Christ, the, and this position of Christ. Christ has been raised from shepherd and teacher uh, among us to Christ the Almighty, the judge at Judgment Day, uh, casting judgment. And so this is more of an imperial Christ who um, the personality shifts. And here we see another uh, view where we have Justinian presenting the, the Hagia Sophia, and you see Constantine offering a model of the city of Jerusalem, which will come back. Um, the, great, the great space, the paving itself, becomes an important place of articulation. Here we see uh, what appears to be um, a grave marking for uh, the Doge of Venice, Dandolo, uh, who uh, is responsible for one of the great internal conflicts within the Christian church, and more on that later. But... Um, uh, Here's uh, an older photo of the quality of light that comes in um, during the Islamic period. Uh, it's pre still its presence uh, looming over the city uh, as it does today. The extraordinary measures taken structurally with these steel cables indicated at the top and the bottom. And in the uh, transformation into the mosque in 1453, they need to reorient the interior space of worship towards Mecca, the Qibla. And so a mirab is installed into the church to give a focal point in the Qibla wall uh, towards Mecca. Uh, here's a comparison of the scale between Suleimanie and Hagia Sophia. As you see, a thousand years separate the two, but Hagia Sophia still uh, achieves a greater span and height. Uh, the maintenance, uh, the ongoing maintenance is, is very difficult. Um, and you see some of the icons remain uh, covered up, while others are uncovered. And you start to see the human figure uh, of all these icons. Now, this whole church strategy of Hagia Sophia, with this, it's Formal expression is of a centralized type of building, but it has an elongated form because of the half domes and the tympanum, uh, the difference between the two sides and the two ends, which reflects the first uh, official Christian churches once they came out of the basements of people's houses where they were meeting in secret. Uh, the first, you've seen this building before. It's the old St. Peter's Basilica in Rome that was then demolished uh, to make way for the new St. Peter's. And we see a Roman basilica, which is basically a meeting hall, with the addition of some elements on one end. Originally, it was just a, a half circle to mark the end of the hall, 
to give a focal point to the congregation. Uh, but it increasingly gets more and more complex with the addition of the transept, a narthex entry porch, uh, and we'll see it uh, as we go forward in time in this lecture, how complicated these elements can become. Yes? They do. The aisles do act as, they have a structural uh, function, especially in the later versions when they get more and more adventurous. Uh, but already they are performing a bracing function against lateral loading of uh, wind loads. And the idea is you make the column spacing as great as possible to open up the hall so the congregation has more access to the end of the hall and can see and participate in the uh, ceremonies. And here uh, we've seen pictures like this when we were looking at uh, St. Peter's. Michelangelo's centralized building gives way to uh, the final form of St. Peter's Basilica that we saw, uh, which is an elongated. Thus, this is another version of taking these two distinct uh, formal types of the centralized uh, baptistry uh, building where it's there to commemorate a single event. Remember originally Pope Julius II wanted to create this great tomb for himself and that's why he justified destroying the old St. Peter's and later popes said no we need to take care of our flock uh, and so they extended the hall uh, in a different kind of compromise that we see in Hagia Sophia between the centralized and the linear. Here's another one. We've seen this last week. Uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulcher in Jerusalem, the tomb of Jesus, and uh, the uh, site of the crucifixion um, also is a struggle to accommodate these two distinct building types, the event of the resurrection and then the congregational hall in the basilica form with the attention drawn to one end, where the apse locates the uh, altar and the ceremony and ritual of the Eucharist. Here's a picture of the Mediterranean uh, just before. If you can see the difference between the pink and the red, you'll see that um, the Byzantine Empire, at the time of Justinian's uh, elevation to emperor, and then the extension uh, across the Mediterranean, the recapt retaking of uh, Italy, uh, and he locates the new capital in Ravenna, up closer to where Venice is. And he builds San Vitale of Ravenna, and this is an example of an earlier uh, centralized form with the use of the apse, apse to create a linear form. And so this is an earlier hybrid that precedes Hagia Sophia. Uh, again, you see that it's fundamentally a centralized domed structure, as we saw, like the Dome of the Rock. But with this elongated apse, you see the polychromy of the marbles, the rich use of icons and mosaic treatments um, uh, throughout. And the representation of important figures of the church, Justinian, and the paradise of heaven to come. So here it is, it was important to give people a sense of what heaven was going to be like. Uh, and this just gets more and more uh, serious a business and undertaking as we move forward. And so we here we are uh, looming up over Istanbul, Constantinople, the Mediterranean world. Um, so <laughs> Constantinople here and Venice. We're going back to Venice. So this island state, um, basically a bunch of buildings separated by canals, built on piers in the water, perfect place to launch ships from, to build ships, and to dominate global trade for several centuries. Uh, and the wealth accumulating from that spice trade in particular um, accumulate and fund the grand constructions of Venice. The... Um, Venice, at this point, and we've talked about this before, uh, Venice serves as the gateway, the great gateway, for everything that is not produced within Europe. Spices, porcelain, gold, ivory, 
slaves, uh, coffee, uh, everything, silk, everything that is coming from China, which of course was the great uh, producer of consumer goods uh, at the, for several centuries, it is all coming through the Muslim-dominated trade routes uh, through uh, Cairo in particular and Constantinople. And it's through these two great gateways they come to Venice and Venice dominates and accumulates the wealth. Um, Venice is trading with Cairo at a time when the rest of Europe is kind of unified and mobilized against the, the Islamic threat and it's seen as this competitive thing. Venice is not monarchical. It is a city-state governed by a council and an elected doge. And the doge is there to smooth the way for com commerce. And so Venice always finds a way, no matter how uh, despicable the uh, Mongol horde or the Muslim infidels are, they find a way to look past that and trade with them. And the benefits accrue dramatically. Um, and then in 828, the year 828, these two Venetian uh, merchants uh, trading with Cairo, actually through the port of Alexandria, which we'll visit in future weeks, um, they manage to smuggle the bones, the remains, the physical remains of St. Mark out of Alexandria and to Venice. And Venice feels a strong connection with St. Mark because St. Mark, and here is the symbol of St. Mark, St. Mark visited Venice once. And it's based on that visitation that Venice makes a claim to, uh, to own the rights to St. Mark, including his bones. Um, and so St. Mark's, the, the Basilica of St. Mark's has a statue of St. Mark at the top. St. Mark is the lion. Uh, St. Mark is one of the four evangelists that are commemorated in the domes of uh, the Moscow Kremlin Church that we looked at. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the four evangelists. They go out evangelizing after the death of Christ. They go and spread Christianity throughout the world. Mark goes to Cairo and Alexandria. He establishes the church in the, on the continent of Africa, uh, which um, we'll look at more in the next site. And he becomes the bishop of Alexandria. And in his battle against icons, against idols, idol worship, he is martyred. They, they tie a rope around his neck and drag him through the streets of Alexandria and bury him. Uh, 800 years later, the two merchants liberate his body. They smuggle it in a uh, barrel of pork, and they take it back to Venice. Uh, and here the relics are placed in the, uh, the, the Doge's palace for several hundred years, uh, where in the course of the turmoil of those several hundred years and violent takeovers, they lose the bones. Uh, they lose St. Mark. St. Mark is lost. Um, and then uh, in 1094, they're building the church, and it's very important that they find those bones. Uh, here is the four tetrarchs. They are the, the co commercial leaders, the leaders of the council uh, that uh, elects the doge. Um, the internal power struggles uh, of Venice uh, is more complex than we're going to go into. But here's the doge's palace in uh, Venice. Uh, you'll see this is a, a preview of the Gothic to come and the question, the eternal question, to what extent uh, is the Gothic uh, uh, beholden to Islam and for some of its forms. Uh, very convincing uh, research still being done. Here you see on the facade of St. Mark's um, a depiction of that very important moment when the two merchants have placed the bones of St. Mark in a basket of pork. The inspectors, the Muslim inspectors seen with the turbans are there to inspect the shipments to make sure they're not stealing anything like saints bones. And, but they're disgusted by the pork. Pork is uh, taboo in Islam. And so they, they don't search thoroughly and the bones make it back uh, 
back to Europe. Uh, this is the, um, the practice of, of worshiping uh, the, the relics is a very important aspect of the Christian church for much of its history. A, a church that has access to something like the bones of a saint becomes a pilgrimage site. Since in the second coming, we will all be reborn, given new bodies, and rise to heaven where Jesus will reign in glory, uh, we know the saints are going to heaven. And so just being in the presence of these bones, smelling the same air, breathing the same air in which these bones exist, is a source of great spiritual power. And so we are going to do whatever we can to visit as many churches with these relics in our lifetimes as we can. It's like the, the pilgrimage to Hajj. It becomes an obligation of the faith of Christianity. Uh, not only that, we talked about indulgences in the past. When you do this, when you uh, walk or crawl to these pilgrimage sites and breathe that air, this idea of presentia, you're in the actual presence of the substance of the Apostle Mark. You earn indulgences. You get time taken away from your time in purgatory. The other way to do it, as we saw with the Reformation, was you can pay the church. And it was the uh, corruption that uh, emanated from that practice that in part inspired Martin Luther to nail the 95 Theses on the church door, thus sparking the Reformation and the split of, uh, between the Protestant and the Catholic religions in Europe. And so here we see uh, the moment in 10, 1094, the 1093, when the, the Basilica of St. Mark's is being built. They don't know where the relics are. It is said that the statue of St. Mark raised his arm and pointed to the resting place of his bones. And so the, the relics were rediscovered and put in their proper place. Um, this is not St. Mark. This is just uh, an example of how these relics are uh, presented. And so uh, the grand construction of St. Mark's Church and the piazza uh, can move forward. Um, this rich uh, iconography, gold leaf, uh, it is a demonstration of wealth. Uh, the authority of Venice to dominate, uh, in part, uh, derives from the fact that it has the relics of St. Mark. It derives from the fact that it has been chosen by God as a favored location. Its wealth uh, further reinforces uh, the validity of its claims to power. Um, and in 1202... Uh, the Fourth Crusade launches from this location. Um, Dandolo the Doge says, um, um, I will finance your crusade. Uh, and Richard the Lionhearted says, we want to take a holy land, but it's been uh, invaded by Saladin of Cairo. And so let's go to Cairo, weaken Saladin's uh, power base, and then we can go on to the holy land. And they expected 35,000 crusaders to show up in, in Venice uh, to go on the crusade. Uh, it's a long walk. Let's take a boat. Uh, and so Venice, uh, with a promise of the finances that go along with crusades, Richard the Lionhearted imposes a tax uh, in England. And uh, at that promise, they build a vast fleet of ships when only 11,000 crusaders show up and uh, not enough money to pay for the fleet, Dondolo says, ah, I'll consider it an investment. All you have to do for me is just go conquer the city of Zara in, uh, in Greece, on the, on the Greek peninsula, and, and, and it'll be fine. And when you get to the Holy Land, when you, these crusades tend to generate huge amounts of wealth when they sack uh, Jerusalem and take all the wealth of the, of the Muslims, it, um, it turns out to be a great investment. And so Dandolo says all this. They go to Zara. They fail to take Zara, uh, which is not a good sign. Uh, but they do meet uh, the nephew of the king of Germany, 
who happens to be a claimant to the throne in Constantinople, the Eastern Greek Byzantine Church Christian throne of Constantinople. He says, listen, if you sail to Constantinople and place me back on the throne of the patriarch in Constantinople, we can reunify the Eastern and Western Church, which had gone through some problems when the patriarch was excommunicated by the Pope in Rome, thus splitting the East and Western Church. Let's, let's stop in Constantinople on the way to Jerusalem, and let's reunify the church. And they say, okay. So uh, the Crusaders head off for Constantinople. The Pope hears about this and says, I don't care if you're going to reunify the church. This is not the way Christians should behave. He excommunicates all the Crusaders. They arrive in Constantinople, restore uh, the nephew of the German king to the throne, and then he's killed in a coup. And so the Crusaders are panicking. They've come all this way. They've done all this crusading. We can't go back empty-handed. And so they do what any of us would do. Actually, I hope not. They conquer Constantinople again. They take Constantinople, Constantinople again. This time, they don't hold back. They, uh, they murder. They rape. They pillage. They remove the statues, they strip the churches of gold, including Hagia Sophia. They take um, everything they can back with them to Europe. They leave in its place um, a, a Roman Latin uh, fiefdom and uh, divided um, amongst them. And the wealth of Constantinople flows back to Venice. So it's a very strange and odd chapter of this history where you have the Christian church uh, operating on a crusade operation against the Christian church. And uh, Constantinople never really recovers. Venice thrives. Venice has a colony uh, in Constantinople for the next uh, 60 years um, until they weaken and give it up and the Greeks come back and they take over Constantinople again, but they never recover from this 1204 Fourth Crusade. Um, they never quite recover. Here, here's this, this series of crusades, um, and finally the fourth one that ends in the sack of Constantinople, and they're done. They don't go on to Cairo, they don't go on to the Holy Land, they're just done. And they bring back these horses, among all the other things. And Venice enjoys a golden period of dominating the trade of the Mediterranean. They are the sole commercial connection to the rest of the world for Europe until the Portuguese uh, and the Spaniards take over. Then it moves, as we've talked about in the past. I'm just reminding you of what we've said. It moves from Venice to Genoa to Antwerp to Amsterdam than to London. And that's uh, the story as we've been telling it in reverse order. But here's an example of the great wealth, uh, the gold uh, panel at, at the altarpiece um, uh, of St. Mark's. We could talk about Napoleon and what he does uh, when he takes St. Mark's, but they've pretty much recovered all that very quickly. So. Uh, any questions? So now we're going to Africa. This is the weird uh, aberration in this history. Uh, there was a mythical story of Prester John, this great uh, priest who, uh, from the early centuries after Christ, uh, established a Christian kingdom somewhere in India. And then the story went, well, maybe it wasn't India. You know, what is India? We're calling uh, people in South and Central America Indians. So there's a great deal of looseness about this term India. So somewhere in India, or somewhere other than Europe, which is basically what India means at the time, there's this huge Christian kingdom ruled over by Prester John. Uh, and it turns out, um, many believe that they're referring to King Lalibela. And uh, Lalibela uh, has a vision. Um, 
he has a vision of Jerusalem at the moment when it falls to Saladin, the Cairo Muslim ruler that we were just talking about, uh, that was so important to the Third and Fourth Crusades. Uh, he has a vision, you must have heard, uh, uh, through the trade routes that come down the Zanzibar coast that we know all about because of our trip to, um, uh, to visit uh, the, the House of Wonders uh, in Zanzibar. So through the trade routes, he hears about the fall of Jerusalem to Saladin of Cairo. And he's visited in a dream, and it's either God or St. George instructs him to build a Jerusalem here on earth. And it's not just an earthly Jerusalem. He builds two Jerusalems. He builds a Jerusalem, an earthly Jerusalem, and then he builds the River Jordan, and then he builds a heavenly Jerusalem. And so it's a complex of 12 churches, but they aren't your normal churches. They're not based on uh, the basilica or the baptistry of Italian structures. It's actually a rock-cut architecture, and it probably derives from a visitor coming from... Uh, from India. And we'll trace this rock cut thing. And we are following in the footsteps of the great uh, initiator of this course, Mark Yarzenbeck, who has done a great deal of original research on rock cut architecture. He wrote the Wikipedia page on rock cut architecture. Uh, and this is, the, many of these slides are his. Um, but these churches are cut out of the living rock. It's a tufa limestone they dig down into it, and, and then in through the doors and windows, uh, and then cut down from there. They cut up to the ceiling and down from there. It is one continuous monolithic piece of stone. I am so glad this was not my job, because I've done a lot of construction, and you make mistakes. And this is an unforgiving uh, process. You can't really afford to make mistakes. So um, this Christian, uh, it is, we're in Ethiopia, uh, in East Africa, up in the high hills uh, of this dry landscape, actually mountainous landscape, up at around uh, 1,500 meters above sea level. Um, and we see uh, this, this is the St. George Church cut out of the living rock, carved um, in place in a very short amount of time. And one of the key aspects of this process is water. You start with the water because the River Jordan is one of the key ingredients of this formulation of the Old Jerusalem, New Jerusalem, River Jordan, dividing the two. And so here we see the process that yields the St. George Church. You cut down in a well. You discover the surface of the water. And it's the water level that establishes everything about the church. And we'll see why. And so these elaborate architectural details are not additive of masonry elements. They are all cut out of this continuous monolithic stone, the tufa uh, limestone. And here you see, um, just imagine what it was like to kind of dig a tunnel in and then move your way towards the ceiling. Pre-planning every move, you have to really understand what you're going to, what you're doing, um, and it's a remarkable technological achievement, unprecedented in anywhere close to this location. Um, we'll, I'll present what Mark thinks um, is happening here, and so here's uh, an entryway down, um, down into this landscape of the twelve churches. Uh, we see the River Jordan running between the earthly Jerusalem and the heavenly Jerusalem. And in each case, there are water uh, sources and, that feed these rivers, starting with a, uh, a spring that is the ultimate source of the river. And so we have to look in section to start to understand uh, what, um, what is going on here. And... And so, let's see, there's the, there's the well, and it's filled with papyrus reeds. And if you remember your Bible stories, uh, the papyrus reed refers to Moses. Moses is uh, set adrift in a 
in a little cradle of reeds, and he's floating on the Nile amongst the, the reeds when he's discovered by the family of the Pharaoh and adopted and raised as um, the family of the Pharaoh before leading the Jewish people on the exodus uh, towards freedom in Israel. And so it's a reference to um, uh, this story. Uh, it's the water, and it's the water level is very crucial. And um, Mark's research looks at the difficult task and just how difficult it is to establish the level of the church in relationship to this uh, unpredictable and difficult to ascertain water uh, source. And so here you see the water level, the trench where the water is flowing. This is the River Jordan. Um, the site of Lalibela uh, is 2,500 meters. Uh, it's 1,000 meters above the valley floor. And it has this sense of a miraculous presence of water. How does water come out of the stone way up high like this? It appears to be one of the higher spots around, but it turns out that it's along this ridge, and there are actually higher parts than the Lafa Mountains um, and the uh, Mount Joseph uh, Peak at 3,200 meters. And so there is uh, an aquifer underground that um, somehow <coughs> they keep they keep track of this aquifer, and it appears to be at a high point, and so an unlikely place for water to emanate from the rock, but it's actually being fed by the higher mountain range um, to the north. And it's an artesian well, and um, I don't understand how this works. If one of you can explain it to me, that would be great. I would think that uh, if there's water up here, underground in the aquifer, but that would provide enough head pressure for water to seek its own level and come up through that well. But somehow the, the way artesian wells work is that there is a, a equilibrium pressure level that establishes the location of the water level uh, in this very difficult to predict way. And so th before they start cutting the rock, they have to find a place the, the relationship between the water level and the church is crucial. If they do it too low, the church will flood, and it's pointless. If they do it too high, the church, the water level will be too far down below uh, the church itself, and that also doesn't work. They need to Goldilocks it. They need to find a place that's just right. And so somehow they do this, and they locate the water level by digging to it, and then they build the church according to that. Now Mark's idea, Mark's theory, is that this seems to come out of nowhere. Um, his idea is that it comes from India. And here's a very similar form uh, that we find in Mahalbalipuram in India, uh, at the source of the Ganges, the sacred Ganges River that we will be looking at in a few weeks, uh, that this tank, uh, is where the water comes from, and then it flows downhill through these temples and becomes the source of the Ganges River. And the sculpture along the way is a celebration of that water. Here Mark has uh, graphically added the flow of water because it was dry when he visited. Now his idea is that um, the rock cut tradition of Lalibela comes to Africa via India and the Ellora Caves of some centuries earlier. And that one man, probably a man, came from India, came to Lalibela, and he presented this science and technology of the rock cut architecture uh, to King Lalibela. In turn, this tradition spread to the Magao Caves in China, we'll be looking at that. Came from Darius's tomb, we'll be looking at that. From Petra, not sure if we'll be looking at that. Lyceum tombs, we will not be looking at that. And ultimately, trace, he traces it back to uh, Abu Simbel, which we've already seen when we saw the building of the Aswan Dam. So all mostly familiar uh, locations to the course. Um, after King Lalibela's death, we see um, this church built uh, in his honor. And we see this icon uh, 
being painted and repainted over the, the, the centuries, where we see King Lalibela being depicted as Moses, who you will recall touches the stone with his staff and water emerges. And so a very direct connection between Moses, King Lalibela, this church, uh, as the earthly Jerusalem, we cross over from this plain, we cross over the River Jordan, if you know your spiritual hymns, crossing over the River Jordan is when you get to the other side, that's dying and going to heaven. And on the other side, we all get new bodies and we uh, exist in uh, the realm ruled by Christ, uh, in the new Jerusalem. Any questions? Yes. Twelve churches, and what some of them were on the earthly side, and some were on the heavenly side. Was there a difference I will ask Mark, um, but since the Church of Saint George is the one that everybody is looking at and venerating, um, you know, I, I'm presuming that's the most remarkable uh, example. The others look; uh, some of them are larger. But they uh, they appear to be less elaborate, and Mark didn't take any photos of this that I have access to. Um, let's do that again. Who's been to Chartres Cathedral in France? One. Okay, you'll go. Um, so here we are in the Mediterranean. Um, the spread of Christianity uh, through Europe. Uh, we should mention quickly Romanesque architecture. Uh, when we looked at Florence, uh, the Florentine leadership looked at the baptistry of the Florence Cathedral and they said, must have been the Romans who built this. Was it the Romans? No. It was much, much later than Roman construction. It was Romanesque. It was built in the manner of Rome. It was Romanish. Uh, and so the Romanesque manner of church construction dominates um, for centuries until we get to France in the 12th century. And it's a remarkable story that does boil down to one man, uh, this abbot of Saint-Denis, Abbot Suget, who is a very par powerful, he's not just some priest who hangs out in the monasteries and meditates and prays, he actually rules France. Um, uh, on uh, while King Louis is off on his crusading. Um, so he, he's the interim emperor of the kingdom. And so um, Abbot Suget uh, has this vision. He sees, and it's a kind of a Machiavellian, it's a, it's a mass marketing vision. He's a genius of spreading the faith. And he sees a way that this Romanesque tradition, which is kind of small and for the elite, and uh, it's not a mass market uh, product. And he pushes it uh, through a series of innovations to the point where it can reach a much larger audience and touch people uh, much more profoundly at their heart and soul. And so we're seeing here Chartres Cathedral is arguably the most dramatic manifestation. Some would say Beauvais, but it keeps falling down, so it doesn't really ever reach completion. Chart Cathedral really does, and we're seeing this proliferation of dozens and dozens of cathedral building projects during the 12th and 13th centuries that um, mobilizes, as we were talking about at the beginning, mobilizes a huge population. Uh, these cathedrals take, uh, some of them take Decades, some of them take centuries. Um, in Sharp Cathedral, we see this manifesting as very different constructions. This Romanesque base gets completed with the Gothic tower, and then this Gothic tower. It, it's, it's built in multiple phases, destroyed by a devastating fire in 1194. There's some debate about how much uh, was retained and built upon. 
Well, that's lined up really nicely. Wow. Um, the, um, and so uh, here's a quick look at some aspects of the Romanesque. The Romanesque is a rounded arch. Structurally, not great. Um, uh, you go up from the earth and turn around and go back to the earth. And it's not, some would uh, argue at the time, that it's not the uplifting uh, gesture of the geometry of the pointed arch. And so the pointed arch is seen as superior from a spiritual uh, expression point of view. It is certainly superior from a structural point of view, as we saw uh, when we looked at the Florence Cathedral. Um, other aspects, um, it tends to uh, be a heavier construction on these more classical columns um, and these continuous vaulting systems uh, that are smooth and not as articulated as what comes next. Uh, Suget extends his Cathedral of Saint-Denis. He increases the east end, the, the side that faces the rising sun on Sunday morning, uh, Easter Sunday, the light comes pouring in. And remember the relics? He puts a reliquary here, uh, a place for the relic of the church, if you have one, if you're lucky enough. And then he takes the processional aspect of the Eucharist, the architecture of the procession of the Eucharist to go and take communion. Uh, he continues that processional tradition in an ambulatory, in an expanded uh, choir. This is location, the location of the choir, and so it, it's called the choir, this section of the building. This is the ambulatory, which allows us to perambulate or walk around the relic uh, on special days. These are a series of chapels, which are also a focus of worship, of narrative, uh, uh, again, the denotation of the story of the scriptures. And we have uh, an opportunity to just expand. This is called a chevet, which is a French word for crown. And it refers to the, uh, the ground plan, which appears more like the halo of the body of Christ. Um, and so it develops out of the transept. And then he also uh, complicates the narthex, the entry foyer uh, in a grand portal sequence punctuated by high towers. So he's creating this grander extravaganza. And then he, ex he expands beyond the Romanesque core of the church uh, by adding chapels um, to the main body of the cathedral. Uh, and so here we see this new geometry of the Chevet in Saint-Denis and this more complicated structural arrangement that we're going to very quickly go through. Um, I'm going to assume you have kind of a structural instinct as physics engineering type people. Um, the ribbed vaults uh, are the biggest change, that uh, instead of these smooth curvatures, you develop these ribs. And instead of these semicircular forms, you create pointed arches. And so there's a structural advantage to these moves. It creates a thinner uh, web. Um, this uh, shell be can become thinner. And we get these very tall, lighter uh, structures where the ribs uh, come down more continuously. And instead of just ending at the capital of a column, they continue down in these complex colonnettes. It's as if the ribs are adding, are additive structures, and they're added to the exterior of the column that is now buried inside this sinuous forest of, of trunks. Uh, so you see the, the classic quadripartite, which means four-part vaulting system, which is, um, takes over from the sexpartite, or six quadrants, six portions of the vaulting system. Uh, you see the use Again, this idea, like we saw in Florence Cathedral, how do you minimize the scaffolding and structure? They used this device to uh, maintain axial loading. I can say axial loading to you. Um, it's so that you don't need the, the same kind of scaffolding to hold it up. The flying buttresses uh, are what take the, the thrust. Again, we're back to this challenge of the thrust. It doesn't just take the thrust down to the ground. It does it in a way that tends to block less light. And this is the big thing, uh, if I were to uh, 
finish on time, I would say just think about what happens. All of these moves all point in a similar direction. We're becoming much more structurally expressive, much more structurally efficient, and that efficiency is translated into greater access to light. So we can go through all of these transitions, and it boils down to that theme. All of these cathedrals, this is a fantastic topic that we could spend weeks on, just comparing. We could go from one cathedral to the next, looking at the incremental innovations in each one. The addition of the pinnacle, you know that if someone wants to tip you over, uh, and you're more structurally sound, the heavier you are. And so these pinnacles are added as another countermeasure towards those lateral loads. And so we see um, in the plan uh, development of all these different cathedrals, it's, there's an integration. You can read the plan translated into the cross section, uh, these different stories. Um, Notre Dame uh, in Paris has a three-story three elevation on the interior, a sex partite um, vaulting system that you can see in the plan. And this is the configuration of the aisles, the gallery, and the nave. Uh, and we're not going to... Beauvais is the highest one of all. They fall several times. Um, we can look at these. Here's the interior elevation of Chartres. This is the advantage of looking at a single example to stand in for the dozens that we could be looking at. So we're just going to look at Chartres. It goes back to the three-story interior elevation, the blank... Gallery here is because in section you see the roof, um, so there's not an opportunity for light. Um, but the structural innovations um, all add up, if you can read this, it adds up to increasing the level of light. The relic of Chart Cathedral, which is responsible, uh, why Chart? It's not Paris. Why is Chart so wealthy that it can build one of the greatest cathedrals? It is said to be the home of the relic of the tunic that Mary is wearing uh, at different moments uh, during the life of Jesus. And the importance of Mary at this point, she rises, the Virgin Mary becomes a very, very important figure. Uh, the pilgrimage routes uh, across Europe uh, converge on the bones of St. James, at Santiago de Compostela, this is the vast pilgrimage route. Who's been on the Camino de Santiago? Uh, okay. Um, this is the earliest form of, uh, this is the Cathedral of Santiago de Compostela. Um, this is St. Um, Charlemagne uh, giving the relic, uh, and that's the story of the tunic of the Virgin to um, the church and the people of Chard. And it's based on this tunic, this relic, the importance of this, that attracts funding not just from the town of Chard, but from all over France, which finances this church. Um, we see here in this comparison of the Romanesque, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, um, this other Romanesque church, and a Hindu temple. The importance of the space of procession around the central object of focus. Um, and the last point, which is all about the light that comes in, that it reaches its pinnacle in a way uh, in Saint-Chapelle. Who's been to Saint-Chapelle? Just crazy light. And this Light, experience of light, is the transcendent experience of Christianity that cuts to the core uh, that Sujet was trying to bring forth uh, in what many uh, point to as this remarkable uh, accomplishment of architecture as mass media to transform an entire religion uh, and huge populations' um, questions. Okay, yes? Did, so did every church manage to find some Um, some, I think there are real relics, but I think there's an awful lot of fake relics because there's just hard to verify. Um, 
Uh, and some churches turn their back on the God thing and say, we're more about, uh, that's, you know, that's idol worship. We're, we're about just reaching God through our own spiritual path. So there's, there's a huge spectrum. But relics certainly played a huge role in mobilizing the faithful, uh, the pilgrimage and donations, etc. Other questions? Invest some time in your term project draft for Friday. The more uh, you are able to achieve for that, the more help you can get from the four of us. Um, so good luck. Thank you. <laughs>